Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Joining us on the program today is author of a very wonderful book called Monkeys Are Made of Chocolate. It's an exotic and unseen Costa Rica, and it's written by our guest today, Mr. Jack Ewing, who started out in Costa Rica by building basically grazing land for cattle, becoming a farmer as far as also growing rice and realizing all at once that maybe I'm just making the wrong decision here and allow this habitat to transform back to its natural rainforest style. And realizing this, writing this book, is making us realize that every little step that we take on this planet, we need to st- take very carefully and thoughtfully as we try to respect the biodiversity that's on this planet. I'd like to welcome to our program today our guest, Mr. Jack Ewing. Jack, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Uh, well, it's nice to be here. It's, it's a pleasure being on your show. Now, I like uh, the uh, forward you have with uh, Daniel Quinn, and uh, I actually had the opportunity to interview him on the book that you mentioned, which was uh, Beyond Civilization. And it's really interesting when you read through the pages of Monkeys Are Made Out of Chocolate, just what we need to do to be careful about how we are when we're on this planet. Tell us about how your transformation began. Well, we, uh, we were raising cattle. In Costa Rica, we had had a, a fairly large ranch, about 800 acres. And about half of it was still in, in rainforest. And um, what we we did was um, uh, started, we had s- some pastures that were on hillsides. And I decided that those weren't good pastures, that it was eroding, and we wanted to, I wanted to reforest them. And so I looked for advice because I knew nothing about reforestation. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, I talked to somebody that really knew what he was talking about, and he said, look, that that hillside is much too steep to reforest. He said, if you do a traditional reforestation with only one species, uh, what you're going to get is uh, uh, more erosion than you're getting right now, and it's just going to be terrible. What you should do is just abandon it, let Mother Nature take it back. Just quit chopping the weeds and let Mother Nature do her thing and the rainforest will come back. Mm-hmm. Well, that was in 1979, and, and today this forest, there's a very impressive rainforest there. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it, that, that was the very first step that we took, and it was really more of an economic decision than it was a uh, a, a, an environmentally motivated de- decision. I, I was just in the process of, of falling in love with the rainforest at that time, and I hadn't, I hadn't really, um, uh, I wasn't reforesting because I necessarily thought it was the right thing to do. It was just that the pasture, it wasn't, it wasn't economically feasible to keep maintaining that as a pasture. Mm-hmm. Which makes a lot of sense, for sure. But now, it's my understanding, uh, at least that I've heard and read, that a lot of the deforestation that's occurring in the Amazon rainforest occurs to create land for grazing. Is that true? That's true, yes. Uh, the Amazon, it's, it's a little different situation right. because they, they have, um, their land there is very poor land. It's, it's 300 million years old. And there's no volcanic action, so the the land is very infertile, and the, almost all of the nutrients are tied up in the biomass, in the in the the trees and the plants and and everything that uh, lives in the forest. And so when you cut that down and burn it and plant pasture and run cattle on it for a few years, well, it it the land is has no ability to recuperate but in Costa Rica where our land is relatively new it, it was just the, the Costa Rica and Panama were just formed about three million years ago mm-hmm. geologically and we have active volcanoes so we have a constant shower of ash you, you don't see a constant shower of ash but over a period of a hundred years there would probably be a couple of inches of ashes on the ground, mm-hmm. and this replenishes the soil, and so 
Uh, we're very fortunate here. We can correct our mistakes when we cut the rainforest down and make pasture and then want to correct that, we can do so. Mm -hmm. Now, um, um, on this particular okay. land that you're at, uh, you got a, you noticed that when the forest had rebounded, Mother Nature had taken care of itself. You've seen an interesting array of balance when it came to the animals, and I know one example you were talking about in the book is there was a time when there were landlords, if you will, who were enjoying bird uh, gaming, hunting gaming birds. I'm sorry, I was trying to remember what I was going to say there, but that uh, then they noticed that the hawks and the higher raptors were beginning to kill these animals, so they figured, well, let's just off these, but then they realized as they were killing the raptors, they were also reducing the game bird population, which created an interesting paradox. Now, that's what was interesting in your book, as you talk about how in biodiversity, how things balance themselves. Well, yes, I remember the the incident you were talking about, uh, where what we've noticed is that the biodiversity eventually takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. it, 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 everything always comes back into balance. When, when the rainforest starts to recover, things tend to go to extremes. Um, one example are the, the quaddies. The quaddie, a quaddie is, a, is an animal that looks it's similar to a raccoon, and it's about the same size as a raccoon, and, and it, it's, it is a member of the raccoon family. But when the rainforest started coming back, the quaddies got completely out of control. Uh, they, we were protecting, uh, protecting them, not allowing any hunting, and we were allowing the habitat to come back. And the population of quaddies increased very rapidly, and they got to be a problem. They were digging up all of the iguana nests, and we, we were afraid they were going to exterminate all the iguanas. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden the coatis kind of got under control again. And they, they, we noticed that they were less of a problem and less of a problem. We couldn't figure it out. And um, we got to studying the situation and just observing and watching. Well, it, it turns out that the monkeys were preying on the young quaddies. They were, the white-faced monkeys are omnivorous. They, they, they eat both animal protein and they eat plants and fruits. And they were going into the quaddy nests, which the quaddies make nests in trees similar to squirrel nests. And they were, the, the monkeys were raiding these nests and eating the young. Wow. And so everything got it under, uh, now the monkeys are pretty much at a level uh, a sub where they, they maintain themselves and the, the coatis are at a level where they m maintain themselves without being a problem to anything or to any other species. Mm -hmm. But our, the process here has been going on for about, about uh, 30 years now. Now, it's funny because some of the stories that you share in here that they might change a person's view of a particular animal. And one that uh, specifically comes to mind is when children think of Fruit Loops and Toucan Sam, they think of a very friendly, jovial bird. But in fact, you had discovered that the toucan was much different than you probably at first thought. Uh, that, that's true of many species, yes. The, the, the toucan... The toucans are also meat eaters. Um, most people think of them as fruit eaters. I, I thought they were fruit eaters at at first, but uh, I'd always uh, the chapter in the book uh, tells how the uh, the um, flycatchers used to. Uh, we I used to watch them harass the toucans, and I never could figure out why until I until one day I. I saw a toucan carrying a baby flycatcher in its mouth that it had just taken out of the nest. But um, we've seen recently, just last year, we, we saw a toucan eat a snake. It's, uh, they, they, it turns out that they eat a lot of things that we never imagined them to eat. Um, monkeys, were, it was a big surprise to me that monkeys would eat baby quaddies. Um, 
and there there are constantly surprises in nature. It's mm-hmm. just um, it, it seems like every time you answer one question about nature, you bring up about a dozen more questions. It, it's so complex, especially in the rainforest. There's so much life. It's the life is almost overwhelming in the rainforest, and mm-hmm. and you. Um, you learn one thing, you learn how one thing works, and instead of getting any closer to knowing it all, it just opens a whole bunch of doors with other questions, and it, it, you just every bit you learn, the more you realize how complex it is. Uh, you never get close to knowing it all about the rainforest. Fascinating stuff. Now, uh, it's interesting because you're also, uh, with the sea turtles, doing quite a large uh, turtle protection program, if you will. Talk about that. Okay, well, every year, in uh, beginning in late July, uh, the sea turtles, and in this area it's the mostly the olive ridley turtle, uh, which is not a particularly endangered turtle. They 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 are threatened. All sea turtles are threatened, but they're mm-hmm. they're not. The, 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 there's other turtles that are m- much closer to extinction than the olive ridley, but they're the the main turtle that nests on our beach. And um, we have a few hawksbill turtles that come in here and nest about that same time, and they. Um, these turtles are, are fairly large. Uh, they're not. Some of the turtles get to be 500 pounds, but these that come into our beach are only about 100 pounds. And um, they they come in at night. They they come in more. What they prefer is when the moon is dark, and when the tide is about right. They like it when the tide's about halfway up, and that way. They come out onto the beach and they walk up high on the beach and they dig a hole in the sand and they lay their eggs and then they, they turn around and they walk back to the beach or back to the to the water. Well, if the tide is ri- rising when they come in, well then when they walk back, they don't have to walk so far because the tide will have risen quite a bit while they were laying their eggs. Uh, the, the hole they dig is about about uh, 20 centimeters deep. That's about 10 inches. And um, th- they lay an average of 100 eggs in each nest. A young turtle will lay less than that, and an older turtle will lay more. Um, these eggs lay there under natural conditions. They're preyed upon by, by coyotes and coatis and and raccoons, things will will dig them up, and then uh, the ones that survive that, when they come out onto the beach, uh, when they when they hatch and come out onto the beach and, and walk to the water, uh, they're preyed on by all kinds of birds. So under ideal natural conditions, uh, maybe one in a hundred actually makes it into the water. Mm-hmm. And then there's all kinds of predators in the ocean. So maybe one in a thousand actually survives to to go on and reproduce. Well, where we live, uh, for a long time there's been a tradition. A lot of people eat the turtle eggs. Mm-hmm. They come out and um, they go out onto the beach and, and try to find the turtle laying her eggs or, or try to find a nest that hasn't where the turtle tracks haven't been covered up by the tide yet, and they'll dig up the eggs, and and they'll eat some of them, but then they sell some of them. The, the bars and the cantinas in town will will buy them, and it's a tra- tradition. They, they're they believed to be an aphrodisiac. Now, that's uh, totally false, but that's the belief. Mm-hmm. So they... Uh, uh, they eat the turtle eggs. They, I, I can't imagine what enjoyment they get out of them. They eat them raw with a little bit of Tabasco sauce and just swallow them whole. But um, uh, a lot of people eat them. And uh, somebody can make more money digging up turtle eggs than they can make um, 
working for eight hours a day. So, so it's a very inviting activity, even though it's illegal. Mm-hmm. Well, what we've been doing since 1984, we try to go out onto the beach and get the eggs before these poachers do, and then we transfer them to a, an artificial hatchery um, where we bury the eggs under uh, the same... We try to simulate exactly the way that the, that the turtle does it naturally. We dig a hole about the same depth and the same diameter and we bury the eggs and we pack them just like the turtle packs the nest when she's finished. And um, the the eggs hatch between 45 and 55 days later. Um, we uh, Most of them hatch right around that time. Uh, once in a while one will hatch a little before 45 or after 55, but most of them are right in the middle of that range. And we, as soon as they're hatched, we, do, we don't wait even a half hour, we start taking them out to the beach and, and releasing them. And uh, they go into the water. Now, once in a while, we'll hold a nest back a little bit because we'll invite a local school to come and, and so the children can participate in this. And uh, we've been doing this long enough that the first children that we had that participated in, in the turtle releases are now adults, and they've come back and told me that they will never eat a turtle egg. And, <laughs> and uh, we've even had angry parents call us up and say that, that what's this nonsense we're teaching their kids because their kids won't let them eat turtle eggs. And... Uh, so uh, the program is having some effect. We, we in the, just in the last 10 years, we uh, were figuring it out. The other day, we've released about 90,000 baby turtles. Wow. wow. And uh, we've noticed we, we don't have any way of knowing it because it's very difficult to mark a baby turtle. They're so small, and any kind of a mark that you're going to put on them will be, be gone when they're an adult. So there's no way of knowing where they go, but most marine biologists believe that it takes them about 12 years before they come back to the beach and lay their eggs. And uh, we've not noticed a lot of things that indicate that the first turtles we've released are now coming back onto our beach and, and laying the eggs. On to Baru Beach is the name of the beach where, where Hacienda Baru is located. Mm-hmm. You know, and that story brings up an interesting point about poaching in the black market, that a lot of times we're losing magnificent species, for instance, like the black rhino. Uh, As I understand, 90% of the shark population has been decimated due to poaching for shark fins. And, you know, so you take a look at a single step where you get children involved, and and then also change habits, for instance, uh, as you mentioned in your book, that... The way that you kind of curb poaching and the money that's being made is to try to encourage more tourism where you have more of an income stream or maybe several, for instance, that actually help local economies while doing the right thing. And this is something that can be carried out pretty much throughout the world in a lot of different habitats, I would believe. Uh, It's very important when uh, people now, uh, just today somebody... Somebody came in to um, uh, Hacienda Baru to the... Uh, we now uh, do a ecological tourism rather than cattle and, and farming. But today a, a man came in and he was one of the worst poachers that, that I've ever seen in this area. And he brought some tourists in mm-hmm. uh, to do a tour and he went on the tour with them. And it, it was really nice to see that. Uh, he completely converted. He would now protect the animals because he realized that uh, that it was it was very important. Not at, well to him personally. He was making money off of the ecological tourism. Mm-hmm. And um, this region where I am is is one of the few tropical regions in the world mm-hmm. where uh, tourism 
or where, excuse me, where the rainforest has increased in the last 30 years, and, and it's still increasing. And this has been brought about in, in, in large part because of the ecological tourism. At, at one point when, when tourism started becoming more important than agriculture and cattle, well, people realized that their land was more valuable if it had rainforest on it than it was if it had pasture on it. Mm-hmm. And so people started letting their land go back, doing the same thing we did at Hacienda Peru. And, and today it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to look at aerial photographs, a uh, comparison of, of nine, the 1970s to, to today. It's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. A lot of wonderful, fun stories in the book. It's Monkeys Are Made Out of Chocolate, our guest today, Jack Ewing. How do you see uh, the future of Hacienda Baru as far as uh, will it continue to perpetuate in the same direction that it's been going? Well, Hacienda Baru today, we, uh, we have, it's about 800 acres. When I first came here, it was uh, about half rainforest and about half uh, pasture. Uh, today, uh, out of the 800 uh, acres, there's only about 15 acres that's not rainforest, and that's where we have a uh, have a Hacienda Baru Lodge. Uh, we we provide lodging for guests, and then we have trails all through the rainforest where uh, visitors can walk, and uh, people that are staying at the hotel uh, can walk there. And then out, people that come from outside just pay an entrance fee like you would when you go into a national park and walk on the trails. And then we offer a lot of ecological tours. And our entire income, that, that's our, our only source of income is ecological tourism. Last year we had about uh, 20,000 visitors. Now that sounds like a lot, but uh, compared to... Um, say the, the closest national park to us is Mano Antonio National Park, which is about 50 kilometers away. And Mano Antonio Park had 300,000 visitors last year. So we have the 20,000 is just a starting place. I, I hope we never get 300,000. I'm afraid the impact on the ecosystem would be would be too high. But I think we could could easily handle 100,000 visitors a year uh, without damaging the, the, the ecosystem. I, I think our trails will handle that many, and uh, it's, a, it's a matter of managing the tourism. So I see tourism increasing. Our roads have improved tremendously in the last couple of years. We just in the last six months got a paved road right out in front of us. Um, so it's um, we expect a lot more tourism in the future. Uh, we're we have uh, taken steps to protect Hacienda Baru. Uh, you worry about things like what will happen to Hacienda Baru when I'm gone. I'm not going to be here forever. So I, uh, my partner and I, uh, Steve Stroud is my partner's name. He and I have taken steps so that. Uh, no matter what happens to us, Hacienda Baru will always remain a, a national wildlife refuge. Somebody couldn't couldn't uh, buy it from our heirs, for example, and and cut all the rainforest down and do condominiums. Uh, that that would uh, would not be legal. Uh, we put what are called environmental easements on the land. Um, the lodge can expand a little bit. Uh, it can uh, uh, get up to where there would be 24 units in it, and the, the tours can expand. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll be making enough money so that we can maintain it as a refuge in perpetuity and uh, still maintain the ecological integrity of it. Um, Hacienda Baru is surrounded I, I'm not so concerned about Hacienda Baru as I, as I am about the surrounding area because uh, that could become overdeveloped. There are many properties there that are 
that are not protected in any way. But we work with local environmental organizations, and um, there's a biological corridor called Path of the Taper Biological Corridor. I, I mention it quite a bit in the book. Right. And um, uh, we're, the, the corridor is coming along fine. We're getting new species coming in. So we're working very hard to try and and um, consolidate the, the corridor and get formal protection on more on more of the properties within it. Um, we've um, we did. There was a taper sighted. Um, well, the the name of the corridor, the path of the taper. Uh, a lot of people. When I, when I give a, a talk sometimes to student groups, I always get the question, what's a taper? <laughs> so if some of the listeners don't know what a taper is, it's, a, it's the largest mammal in Central America, uh, not counting whales, but I mean the largest ma land mammal in Central America. It lo it's shaped like a pig, but it's as big as a cow, and it uh, has a, a short trunk and it uses the trunk to pull vegetation into its mouth and eat it. But there used to be a lot of tapers here. Now there aren't too many. Um, the last taper on Hacienda Baru was killed in 1955. I, I actually interviewed the man who shot it. And um, as far as I know, that was the last taper that was seen in the path of the taper biological corridor. The reason that we call it the Path of the Taper Biological Corridor is because it connects two areas that do have tapers, which would be the Corcovado National Park to the south and the Los Santos Reserve to the north. So the, um, the, the, the tapers uh, we hope will one day come through here again. Well. Last year, a taper was sighted about 12 kilometers from Asien Baru within, the, ta within the, the corridor, and another one was sighted um, by a number of people and a lot of witnesses to, to both of them, uh, also within the in the corridor. So, it um, um, we they are coming back. Uh, last May. A jaguar was sighted about five kilometers from Hacienda Baru. So we're we're hopeful that I mean we see lots of signs that things are coming back. Spider monkeys are coming back. The spider monkeys had disappeared uh, 50 years ago, and now they're coming back. Um, so we're we're very optimistic, and the main thing is just to keep educating people about the importance of the rainforest and, and the ecological tourism. If the people visit the southern Pacific side of Costa Rica, they're, they're helping the cause. Monkeys are made out of chocolate, and our book guest today is Jack Ewing. Jack, thank you for joining us here on the program. It's been a pleasure to talk about biodiversity and the way things are actually working when we start making good choices. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me, and uh, it was a pleasure visiting with you. And Jack, if you could please give out a website, people can find out more about Hacienda Baru. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's just www.haciendabaru.com. Thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. We also want to thank you, the listeners, for tuning in. Be sure to visit us at our website at beyond50radio.com, the number 50, and sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Thanks again for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Remember, live your day past half.